in office for only six months now and the wheels are falling off already. Uh, it's taken Christopher Luxon several months to realise what New Zealanders could see very clearly uh, several months ago that Penny Simmons was making an absolute hash of the disability issues portfolio. She'd gotten off uh, on the wrong foot, uh, had completely messed things up and it's taken him months to actually do something about that. He should have acted at the time and be much more decisive. And one of the things that I call on the new Minister for Disability Issues to do is immediately apologise to the disability community uh, for the way that the whole situation has been handled, but also for the really defamatory and derogatory things that Penny Simmons has been saying about people with disabilities and those who care for them. They have been unjustified, they have been totally unnecessary, uh, and they've caused a huge amount of anguish and hurt within the disability community. And I think that the new minister uh, would get off on a much better footing if she immediately apologised to the disability community for the actions of her predecessor. Uh, when it comes to Melissa Lee, um, it's anybody's guess as to what's been going on behind the scenes there because, of course, the government haven't been saying anything publicly about the onslaught that the New Zealand media has been facing. Uh, Melissa Lee tells us that she was working on a proposal that was ultimately vetoed by the government's coalition partners and appears to have lost her job uh, for something that Winston Peters was ultimately responsible for, uh, for vetoing the action that she was proposing to take, although that's guesswork because the government actually haven't been upfront about it exactly what it is that they are doing behind the scenes when it comes to the New Zealand media. Uh, and then finally, the question Christopher Luxon really needs to ask is, why stop there? Uh, you've had Shane Jones and David Seymour criticising the judiciary. Uh, a minister in my government did that, and they had resigned from their relevant portfolio the same day that it happened. Uh, I want to know why Christopher Luxon thinks that criticising the Waitangi Tribunal uh, is OK, not something that he's going to take any action on. He's got his Deputy Prime Minister, who's also the Minister of Foreign Affairs, likening New Zealand to Nazi Germany. Apparently that's OK, uh, but the actions of Melissa Lee are not. So I, I think Christopher Lux has got many more questions to ask about why he's just stopped at those two. Well, he, he barely raised a finger to do anything about their actions when they did it. I mean, criticising a judiciary is something that the Cabinet Manual... Uh, well, the Cabinet Manual actually says that they shouldn't. Uh, he publicly reprimanded them, and then David Seymour reprimanded him back in return. Um, I think that shows that his own ministers don't have any respect for his authority. Oh, ultimately, as I said about Winston Peters, he never should have gone into government with them in the first place. That's a question for him, really. No, they were never up to the task that they were given, and I think it's somewhat surprising that they were allocated those portfolios in the first place. But actually, the idea that things have suddenly dramatically changed when it comes to, say, the media landscape um, clearly shows that he wasn't paying attention much before he became the Prime Minister. The crisis unfolding in the New Zealand media has been obvious for everyone to see for some time now. Well, let's judge him based on outcomes. I think one of the first things he could do was actually um, say something about what's been happening in the New Zealand media. Melissa Lee's invisibility during a crisis for the media and therefore a crisis for our democratic institutions um, has been absolutely baffling. What yeah. Uh, it shows that it's pretty shallow, um, but it's been pretty shallow right from the beginning. Well, if you look at Melissa Lee being booted out of Cabinet, uh, that's the Minister for Economic Development that's now been removed from the Cabinet. That's a pretty hefty portfolio uh, to not be sitting around the Cabinet table. Louise Upson's made it very clear her number one priority is to get people off benefits. And for those who are in the disability community who rely on that as their primary source of income support, I think that will be, uh, they'll be feeling pretty uncomfortable about that decision. Yeah, 
I'd absolutely call on National to support the bill that we had before the House. Um, it isn't going to solve the whole problem, but it is one piece of a puzzle. They should ultimately be working on assembling the other pieces of the puzzle, though, and we've seen no evidence of that yet. Well, he's certainly one of the first Prime Ministers to sack ministers so soon into being in government, which shows he clearly didn't have particularly good judgment um, if he's sacking them so quickly after making them ministers. But your answer, sir, is that it not just taken decisive action rather than dragging it out? Uh, he should have, if he was going to do that. Why didn't he take action at the time? You called for the Uh, yes, I mean, I think Penny Simmons has handled the disability issues portfolio absolutely abysmally. Um, but actually, in addition to the bad decisions that she's made, the way she's portrayed the disability community has been reprehensible. The idea that people who are living with a disability and those who care for them are somehow ripping off the system, which is a claim that she has repeatedly made, is just wrong. But not only is it wrong, it's incredibly hurtful. She's, she apologised for the way the Ministry for Disability Issues handled it. She didn't apologise for what she has done, and she certainly didn't apologise for the derogatory things that she has been saying about the disability community and the, the people who are caring within the disability community. Absolutely. I would have expected... I would, have, I would have expected the minister concerned to make an apology. So why did the minister apologise to Stuart Nash ultimately paid the consequence for that by no longer being a minister. She's still a minister. Well, if, it's in, if we're talking about rolling, so the real question is, where are Chris Bishop and Nicola Willis right now plotting numbers somewhere around the building? Um, has there been a climate change minister in the cabinet, I think, since 2008? Uh, is that significant having climate change back around the table? It the, the fact that the climate change minister was outside of cabinet in the last two terms reflected the nature of the governing arrangement that we had, that the Green Party held that portfolio and they weren't sitting around the cabinet table. Uh, but the Minister for Climate Change Issues attended all relevant meetings that related to climate change discussion. Uh, I actually think the, the, the bigger question really is, uh, you know, why now? If it, why suddenly has he got this rush of blood to the head and decided that the climate change portfolio needs to be around the cabinet table when he didn't think that when he formed his government only six months ago? Well, they've got more history in rolling National Party leaders than uh, I would care to count. Of course. I think the bigger thing that's hurting this government is the absolute sense of chaos um, that surrounds it. Uh, they lurch from bad decision to bad decision on a daily basis. Uh, and ultimately, I think New Zealanders can see that they're making the wrong choices and the wrong decisions. So if we just take you know, the cuts that they've been making to frontline public services, putting New Zealanders at more risk to pay for tax cuts that almost every economist in the country is saying is going to make the economic situation we're currently in worse, um, it's likely to lead to higher inflation for longer and therefore higher interest rates for longer. So any benefit that New Zealanders get from those uh, tax cuts will ultimately be taken away by the by the overall effect of them. And of course we'll pay, we will all pay for that in the public service cuts that they're seeing. So overall I think New Zealanders who voted for change, and I've said this all along, you know, New Zealanders did vote for change at the last election, but I think the change they're getting is probably not the change that they envisaged. She had the portfolio for a very long time and didn't seem to come up with a single new idea during that time. That's probably a clue that she was going to be a bit out of her depth when it came to dealing with the crisis that's been unfolding within the media. That was years ago. Uh, 
Well, ultimately, if he wanted senior ministers in those roles, he should have put senior ministers in them six months ago. And it uh, says a lot about him that he didn't want to put senior ministers in, his, in those portfolios six months ago. But ultimately, if he's going to be reshuffling um, every time he detects ministerial underperformance in a portfolio, it's going to be like a fast-spinning revolving door. That's ultimately a question for them. Yeah, generally speaking, that, that is the ultimate um, outcome in many cases, that things slow down for a period while a new minister gets up to speed. In the case of the disability community, I think they'll probably welcome a bit of breathing space, but I also think um, they'll be wanting the minister to make some fairly quick decisions to reverse some of the detrimental changes that were made by her predecessor. Um, look, ultimately the government can afford to fix that problem quite quickly. They can afford to do a lot of things if they choose to postpone tax cuts. This is not uncharted territory for New Zealand or even for national governments. Um, in 2000, in, in uh, sort of that 28 to 2010 period, the government, the key government, had, prom had campaigned on tax cuts and deferred making tax cuts uh, whilst we're dealing with the aftermath of the global financial crisis. This government should do the same. We're at the down part of the economic cycle. It's not the time to be making the sorts of cuts that they're making now. I haven't actually seen the detail of what they've said today, so I'll, I'll have a look at that before making that judgment. I certainly think that Anzac Day. I mean, I don't want to get. I don't want to quibble about specific words. Um, Anzac Day is a, a really significant day for New Zealanders. It is a day for us to reflect on our history and reflect on the sacrifice made by um, successive generations in big international conflicts. Obviously, the the day itself marks the Gallipoli conflict. Um, but I think broader than that, um, it has come to also be, if, if you like, our Veterans Day, um, our, our chance to stop and pay tribute to those who have come before, those who have made great sacrifice, and those who have supported them. Uh, when I think about the great conflicts of World War I and World War II, for example, it wasn't just those who went off to battle who sacrificed, it was those who stayed behind as well. Um, and we have the chance to pause for a bit and to think about them on Anzac Day, and uh, I do think it's appropriate. I'll be attending the dawn service in Upper Hutt, as I have, I think, just about every single year that I've been, uh, that had the privilege of being the MP there uh, the last 16 years. Um, and then later on in the day, I'll try and get to some of the smaller local RSAs um, to acknowledge um, you know, those who have passed through them as well. Daily. Um, so I would typically get the, a, a daily briefing every night that I would read every night before bedtime. Um, if I was doing the morning media round in the morning, I'd be up in time to have another briefing um, based on anything that might have happened overnight. Um, and then I would typically, if I was doing a thing like this, you know, during the day, um, take half an hour beforehand. If I could, sometimes it wasn't always possible, but I'd try and take half an hour beforehand to catch up on the latest developments as well. Um, the, Depart the Prime Minister uh, has, unlike any other member of Parliament, the Prime Minister has uh, more advisory capability, so more people um, digesting, synthesising and summarising that information than anyone else in the building, so should be more informed on all the issues of the day than anybody else in the building. Because they have, that, that is what the Prime Ministerial support structure is designed to achieve. Um, I, Look, I don't know all the details of that myself because, of course, I don't have access to all of that advice anymore. Um, but that, based on what I've heard in the media, that is certainly the sort of thing that I would have expected to be updated on as Prime Minister. Uh, 
Um, I, I don't want to politicise Anzac Day, obviously. One thing I would say about the New Zealand Defence Forces is that they are amazing at improvisation. You know, they, they roll with the, the ch an enormous number of challenges that get thrown their way, and I'm sure that they will make the most um, of their contribution to Anzac Day commemorations wherever they are in the world. Um, but obviously it's, it's a challenging time for them, and I, f I really do feel for them. Yeah. Thanks. Cheers.